And we're back, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to Fatso Radio, episode number 44. We have a special, special guest tonight. So tonight we have Mike Collins. Mike is, among other things, founder of SugarAddiction.com. Uh, Mike has a long, long history of experience with everything from addiction, with substance abuse, to sugar, we're going to find out as well. And uh, we have Mike on the show today to talk about his experience, like I said, his background, what's brought him to this point as well. Mike has a book that I want to have him share with our listeners as well. And uh, and then really, really what I'll do uh, for my listeners as well is, like I said, share your experience and then see how it, it kind of marries up with my experiences and then what we're all interested in. It's all, I think, very similar. So Mike, I'll shut up and uh, welcome and thank you so for coming to Fatso Radio. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the work you're doing. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, out there doing podcasts these days and need more health and wellness ones for sure. But uh, yeah, my story, I mean, I have a little podcast version where I talk about uh, how I got here. I, you know, I, grew, I think like a lot of people, I grew up as a regular kid. I mean, I had, uh, we love sugar in the house. My mother was my favorite sugar junkie. It's, uh, she really thought sugar was love for kids. Um, her mom died when she was eight years old and her dad made a deal with her uncle who uh, lived across the street and owned the, the country store that anytime she came in, she could have free candy put on his account. So she didn't really even think he had to pay for it. So she just, you know, she thought it was love. Everybody gets given her candy and feeling sorry for her. And it was just an addiction she never could quit. And I, I actually think she died of it. I really believe that. Um, but, you know, as we grew, I mean, we, we had sugar, and butter, bread and butter sandwiches and Kool-Aid. We didn't have a lot of money, but we always had sugar in the house, some kind of sugar we could eat. And my mother had a stash. We could, you know, we could get into it, whatever. She, she didn't know we knew where it was, what have you. But uh, there's a great quote, uh, it's a great, so you, I guess this goes on YouTube, right? Well, you can look on YouTube, but they're this, and Eric Clapton is being interviewed by Ed Bradley, right? And they're sitting in his $7 million Antigua uh, treatment center, and uh, Ed says to him, so Eric, this is how I'll start it with heroin, right? And, Ed, and Eric Clapton goes, no, Ed, it started with sugar. And he's yeah. like dumbfounded, right? He's like, sugar? How did... And he said, yeah, when I was six or five or six years old, I, I would eat bread and butter and sugar sandwiches. And we used to eat those, right? Yep. It's like anything, anything that would change my state, Ed, anything would change my state. And I had the same way. You know, I grew up with every kind of candy you can imagine. I mean, you can't even think of one that we didn't have that wasn't around back then. And, uh, but then 13 and 14 rolled around and I ran into beer. And uh, beer changed my state quite a bit more. And uh, made me feel better and I could talk to girls and I wasn't like anxious and, and nervous around people. I'm a little bit of an introvert and didn't know that till later in life. But so, you know, drinking alcohol helped and that party lasted until uh, drugs, alcohol, that kind of college. I ran the largest nightclubs in the, in the South for a long time and until uh, about 28. And uh, when I got sober, and we can talk about it, I'm kind of an open book, we can talk about it. But when I, when I about, uh, um, you know, when I got sober, I started to, you know, I started to gain weight and I, you know, I'm not a heavy guy or anything, but you know, my face was all broken out with rosacea and, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, pimples. I mean, here I am almost 30 years old. I had pimples and brain fog and I was always tired and literally I don't think I had any food. I mean, really genuinely, I don't think I had any food. I was just all pasta and breads and sugar and soda. I used to eat, drink 16 ounce Mountain Dews, eight, six or eight of them a day. Highest caffeinated and highest sugar beverage on the market. Wow. Wow. And so I started studying a little bit about it. I read a book called Sugar Blues. And Sugar Blues, written by a guy, an interesting guy. He was at a party one time and a voice from behind him said, I would, he was putting two lumps of sugar in his coffee. Right? He says, I wouldn't have that in my house, let alone my body. And he knew the voice. It was Gloria Swanson, the famous movie star, right? Okay. Yeah. So anyway, they got married and that was like her third marriage or something, but they promoted that book all over the seventies uh, and eighties. It was re redone in the eighties and uh, they traveled around and it was pretty popular back then. And I, and it just, I don't know, something clicked in my mind, you know, God put in my head, this is what I'm supposed to be thinking about. So I ended up raising, I, I quit sugar after, it, it was a while. I mean, it took me two or, th two or three years to figure it all out. But um, uh, so after I got off the sugar, I, my wife at the time, I somehow convinced her to have 
two children, no flour, no sugar, no caffeine, in the womb and until they were six years old. Wow. That's... And one of them just left here. And uh, it's just amazing. The, the, the experiment worked. Uh, so about six years old, we let them have it at a birthday party once in a while, but never at home. And they just are not attracted to it now. And it's really interesting to watch, you know, as far as a normal person. Anyway, that's the podcast version. Mm -hmm. About six or seven years ago, I grabbed the domain name. It's about 10 years ago now, but I started working on it. Um, and I had a regular life, a regular career job. You know, I was online a lot, sold, sold some software and information and stuff. Okay. And I was keeping an eye on the sugar addiction stuff. But I was trying to give people information, but it didn't work. I mean, people... People already know, you know, by the time they get to sugar addiction, they already figured this out. They, they yeah. got a little issue, right? And so a couple of years back, we started the coaching and the online groups, and that's proved to be very successful with helping folks get off it. But anyway, that's the podcast short version. Yeah. I mean, I'll answer any questions. That's how I got here. I wrote a book during that uh, last couple, three years ago, and it's on Amazon, and, you know. Yeah. So I, I, again, I don't. I never, I never wanted to be the anti-candy man. I didn't sign up for this yeah. uh, job to ruin everyone's holidays and birthdays and Easter. But look, the science is there now, my friend. You know yeah. it and I know it. The, everyone knows it, but no one wants to admit it. Absolutely. And in our world, the recovery from substance use disorder world, that's called denial. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a very powerful uh, thing. And yeah. people, and I, again, I, I'll be telling this story until I'm, they put me under because this is, you know, it's killing the kids, man. It's yep. just killing the kids. Absolutely. No, Mike, you have a fascinating story and it means it, 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 so much of it touches home to me. So for, for example, one of the things is when you mentioned about, you know, here have a cookie or here have a sweet, it shows love, right? Or it's a way that sure. our, our mother, our grandparents, you know, kind of showed love. And, and I mean, I, you know, we talked for a minute before the show here, but I grew up in an Italian family, right? So half Canadian, half Italian. My Ita Canadian side is like an Irish English background. So sugar and pasta and wine and beer and everything you can imagine, right? Sure. And, and to the same, and I grew up in the hospitality business or the industry rather. My dad and my mom had a, had a restaurant. My uncles were all, uh -huh. all catering and all that. So sure. food was always around and pasta was always around. Carbohydrates were always around, right? And yep only years years later after i give up sugar after i went through keto and now i'm even gone more of like a carnivore diet okay now that i realized back was that it was really was a sugar addiction but the thing i keep on banging my head against the wall and maybe you can help me with this is how did we, where did we lose focus on hey we, we love our children we want to give our children the best food and we want to also reward them so was it just the, the worst combination of like industrial complex came around and, you know, refined sugars came on board and it just kind of took off because these sugars weren't around, you know, when we were cavemen, you know, we never had these, oh, we never, we never got to this point in evolution yeah. if we had this problem. So where do you think, you know, well, you're hitting my kind of hot buttons really, because <laughs> I really want to know, I think in history in, in all kind of history and all kind of business and politics and, government, you can figure stuff out if you figure out how we got here. How did we get here in this mess, you know? And I just believe it's in the book, Sugar Blues has an interesting history lesson. And, and if you look at the history lesson of sugar, um, you know, the, the Kali cartel or the, the, the cocaine cowboys had nothing on the, the, the people who were bringing sugar in from the Caribbean into England 300 years ago and literally created an empire, you know, on the backs of slavery. Yes. And it's just been enculturated because only kings and queens could have sugar years ago. It was just too yeah. expensive. Mm -hmm. And so now when the average man could have it, it just exploded. And it's easy. And uh, look at Starbucks. It's easy to grow an empire on an addictive substance, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's, I think, that got us here, I know that got us here, is the, the, the kind of head fake or the... Uh, the perfect storm, if you will, that sugar was sweet or is sweet. And that, you know, I think that the, the offending molecule is the fructose, which is sweet. And nature, nothing is poisonous that has fructose in it. So we're attracted to it for various reasons to spread seeds around evolutionarily. But at the end of the day, uh, the culture evolved around something before the science did, right? Now think about cigarette smoking. I mean, I think even back 100, 200 years ago, people, most people, a lot of people thought this can't be good for you, right? Mm -hmm. But most people, it was just a cultural thing. And, and this is what happened with the sugar and it got in our culture. 
in such a way that it now revolves around many, everything. And what you were talking about 30 or 40 years ago when the high fructose corn syrup came in and the sugar industry and the tobacco industry started buying up the sugar uh, products, the big food and the big sugar pro uh, companies, and they just, they literally tur turned their addiction magic uh, selling process on the sugar. Hmm. And so it's been, it's no one's fault. Be honest with you, it's not their fault and it's not the big sugar's fault, it's not big food's fault. It's just a perfect storm of culture that evolved to a point that now, because of the science, needs to be changed and turned around, right? Just like seat belts in cars, smoking in public places, drinking and driving. Heck, when you and I were young, drinking and driving was just, just don't get caught. You know, it wasn't, it, it, yeah. it wasn't a stigma uh, of, that it is today. You know, it's a very, uh, and should be just rightfully so, because the science proves that you're not capable to drive a car. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the science is proving uh, what sugar does to the body, and more importantly, what it does to the brain's reward systems. And that's why you can't quit. That science really didn't exist unless it's really exploded in the last five years. So that's really where we are now. And that's that turn in that battleship of culture is going to take some time. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm seeing a lot of that from, you know, from the diet nutrition standpoint of this ketogenic diet, right? So because it's a mm -hmm. high fat diet, it's a diet that's relying on your body on, you know, to burn fat and ketones, then the natural state, you know, it yeah. turns out, you know, before yeah. we were inundated with all this sugar, uh, it's amazing, amazing that, like you said, once you're outside the storm, you know, I mean, my mm -hmm. buddies talk about this, once you're outside the storm, you can look at it. And at yeah. first I was like, wow, I kind of feel like I'm an addict looking in and I'm like, well, it's exactly what it is. It's not even kind of feels mm -hmm. like. It. I mean, yeah. but now oh, sugar still has that pull on me. It's like, you know, that, I mean, it's, I don't know what it is. Maybe you can explain it in a more scientific way, but I, I fear it's probably always going to have a potential pull on me. Yeah. It what do you think about that? Like, well, I mean, the people don't like the word addiction. They don't like the word addict. And rightfully so, nowadays, the, the proper term is substance use disorder okay. um, because of the stigma. Alcoholic, alky, junkie, you know, these kind of terms are de derogatory, just like you know, the N-word would be derogatory. You can't, you know, society changes, it evolves, it grows. And uh, the, you know, the, the growth around uh, AIDS um, healthcare was not really something, they weren't outing people just to be mean and they were doing it for healthcare. They were trying to, to destigmatize and it actually worked, you know? And that's what has to happen here. This is really a healthcare issue. It's not a, but people do not like the term addiction. But when you look at the science today, and see the difference between my stance uh, and where I come from is I, I 95% of people or 98% of people that are helping people with sugar come from a health coach background or something like that. Or, and I'm literally studying the brain chemicals that are identical to the ones that cause addiction in dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, the big one, oxytocin, right? These are drugs that are affected by substances uh, and sugar is just pounds the hell out of it. Yeah. And when you're eating that much high fructose corn syrup in the diet, if you're eating that much sugar, 150 pounds a year, and you're just constantly barraging your you're literally something that took millions of years to evolve to a perfect homeostasis. Now you're trying to manipulate it manually and it's basically free. I mean, you don't have to really pay for it. You don't have to rob a bank or anything to yeah. get it. You can just you know, go to your cupboard or whatever. And it's so inexpensive. People think of it as just like something in their, in their world, right? And they do not equate the two things together. They don't equate the slight lift in emotional feeling, they don't, the, the, the self-esteem raise, the little bit of energy raise, they don't equate the two together until they try and stop. Exactly. And then withdrawals happen, and then they're like, oh, like you said, looking in from the outside, right? And you, like, if you've been off it for a while, then all of a sudden you get a little accidental ingestation from a salad dressing or something somebody swore was no sugar and they got like a little buzz yeah. not a big one but you're just elevated a little bit right then you crash you're tired you're irritable you know 
And this, when someone goes through withdrawal, people don't think that sugar withdrawals are real, right? Wow. They should spend five minutes in my inbox or my, my message, my Facebook messenger. I mean, it's real, real. And people that are like 100, 200, 300 pounds overweight, losing the limbs, going blind, the doctor says you're going to die. They still can't quit. Mm -hmm. This is not a food issue or a health issue. This is an addiction issue. That's right. Yeah, you know, it makes so much sense to me too because every time I talk about it, every time, you know, the deeper I run into it or the deeper I delve into it, I guess, the, the more I see, like you said, it is an addiction. And, but it's, it's one of those things where as a society, we've, been, we've just given sugar a pass. We're just calling yeah. it that, that thing that we, we know it's bad. Our grandparents know it's bad. We know it's bad. Everybody knows it's bad. Anybody who has kids knows it's bad for the kids. But we all still give right. it a pass. We all still use it as a reward at school. Like, <clears throat> you know, I'm the, I'm the parent that checks, you know, make sure my kids' lunches don't have any sugar, but all the other kids do. And I, you know, I yeah. get, my daughter gives me the dirty looks, but it's, it's, it really is a cultural thing. And I think that it was a matter of bad timing. You know, things became super sugary, super refined. And at the same time, we got all this science technology doing all these, um, you know, studies about how to lose weight. And at the same time, I don't know, I think it was the 60s or 70s. It was kind of the perfect storm where, you know, sugar was, put it into everything at the same time they started demonizing fat and that's where yeah. it kind of plays a lot of, into kind of my thing with the whole fat cell radio thing is that i've lost 125 pounds nice. by eating a high fat low carbohydrate diet and like you now i'm banging my drum saying do this do this and there's i'm finding out in a million reasons you know the yeah. addiction the you know the, the brain fog the you know the I'm, i feel you know i'm 41 years old and i'm in the best shape of my life you know so there's a lot yeah. of things that um, it, it's so weird like you said you're looking at it now and i'm looking through a different lens and i'm like man, I want to go to every kid in every school and all, you know, all the high schools and say, get out of the sugar, you know, eat the pork chops like your grandma told you to eat the bacon or eat the, you know, eat the, yeah, yeah. Eat the lamb chops and the sausages. And so it's like, do you think it was like, do you agree with that? I guess where it's like, you know, they, they demonize fat. And then at the same time, if someone was trying to lose weight from the seventies, eighties, nineties, they really had no options. We know sugar is bad for us. And they told us not to eat fat. So like, that's what yeah. got me in trouble. I got up to 330 pounds and was there wow. for 20 years. So well, they, I mean, yeah, I mean, they had to put, because when you take the fat out of food, it tastes terrible. So they had to put sugar in it, they had to put something in it, right? right. And yeah, I mean, I'm not a big conspiracy theorist. Um, I know what they did. They know what they did. And they had uh, shareholder value to think about. And I don't have any gripes against that. I mean, that happened. And it, it was just uh, what, where we were. What, ha what we have to take responsibility for now is that we need to turn this battleship around. Right. And that part is really going to be tough because you're right, there was misinformation out there, uh, the Ansel Keys thing and that, mm. you know, that, the demonizing fat. And I learned a lot. We ran a uh, Quit Sugar Summit. Uh, and we've got all the greats, you know, Lusting, Tobbs. I mean, we've got everybody, Dr. Tim Noakes and uh, the carnivore guy himself, Sean uh, Baker. Baker I mean, we yep. have everybody, and they can, you know, quitsugarsummit.com. I mean, that's it. I learned so much about it. And, you know, we're a little bit agnostic in that we do have vegetarians that, that uh, get off the sugar. It's a little harder, I think, because a lot of it revolves around carbs. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the science is going to win, but here's the thing with science, you know, it's going to take a little time to, mm -hmm. to get this out to the general public, right? To re for the public to realize we got ourselves here and we have some big, big companies that have a lot to lose, uh, to give up this monopoly or this, uh, this market share on sh with sugar and, and uh, ultra processed carbs, which is basically everything in a bag, a box, a can, like, uh, well, you know, a package and not real food. If they ate real food, they wouldn't need me or you. That's true. Right. If they yeah. like, and if you look at those films of the twenties, the thirties, the forties, the fifties, there's no overweight people. When I was young, there was literally only one or two obese kids in a school of 3000 teenagers. True. Right. And that was it. And nowadays it's 30%, 30%. That's what hurts my heart the most, man. That's the part that <laughs> they children from zero to four, uh, don't have any, responsibility at all we have we give them the food and we have an epidemic 
of uh, obese one, two, three, and four year olds. It's insanity, right? And we do know the answer, and it, the answer is whole food. And then I know that to, to be the brain chemical stuff that's once you get hooked, and, and they, what, you, know, you remember Rodney Dangerfield, you know, like, like he <laughs> gets, yeah, I get no respect, right? <laughs> He's pulling on his tie, right? And so sugar gets no respect as a drug of addiction, of a psychoactive drug that could possibly change your state and is integrated into the food system so that it appears that you're not ingesting a drug like shooting or drinking or smoking. You're not yeah. doing any of those things. It just seems like you're going about your day and you're eating things that everyone else eats. It only happens, the break only happens like what happened with you is you separate out food from food-like products, food-like substances, yeah. right? And when you do that, and you write it down, and you realize how you feel when you're about to ingest sugar, how you feel after you ingest sugar, how you feel the next day when you eat a lot of sugar, when you start to put this all down, it all starts to make sense. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And like you were saying about the whole sugar thing, I mean, you know, you know, right from the beginning, we are indoctrinated at a young, young age, you know, yeah. from everything from the, you know, the formula has more sugar, of course, more glucose than you would in breast milk and oh, then the, the apple juices and then the treats and, and all that stuff. So you're right. It's yeah. going to take us, um, you know, keep on bound, you know, banging the drum, um, you know, and kind of get the word out as far as, you know, back, back to whole foods. Like you said, it's not complicated, right? It's not complicated. At the end of every time I it's talk. It's not complicated. Me, it's not easy. What is this saying? It's not, it's easy, but it's not, oh, I don't know. It's, it's, it's simple, but it's difficult. Not, yeah, <laughs> yeah, simple, but it's yeah, difficult. Right? Exactly. And, like, and, you know, and, and um, if we say, you know, remove the sugar from our diets, okay, well, we know that, we know that. But then once you, once people really get educated to where sugar is hidden, like you said, it's everywhere. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then the other thing, I, 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 when you mentioned the whole sugar being hidden everywhere, it really can, it kind of puts comparison in my mind. Could you imagine if they spiked all of our food with a little bit of alcohol? Like, <laughs> you know, got us tolerant, got us dependent of it. I mean, there, there would be a huge yeah, problem. Yeah. And essentially, that's kind of what they've done. Um, but like I said, not to, not to kind of shit on it too much. But Well, no, I mean, it's, it's very real. It's a very real thought. You yeah. know, it's true. It's very true. And, and it just doesn't get any respect as something that could be hurt, harming us, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, like I said, there's so much money involved and there's so much industry involved. Um, and, you know, but like you said, you know, the, the, a lot of people that are talking about the diet nutrition, kind of losing weight, they don't talk about the psychology, the psychology of it. And for mm -hmm. me, like I said, even not having a background in psychology and not, not gone through all the studies, I've kind of done my own little experiments and, you know, when you, and when you know that when you're eating food, um, that a doesn't make you hungry again in a couple hours, that's good for your psychology <laughs> Yeah. and the food that gives you the energy and you know, helps you sleep at night, you know, it's just, and it's like, you're not, you're not having this craving all the time, all the time. And even just the cravings itself can easily be compared to any, any kind of a drug addiction. So it's, oh, uh, I joke, you know, I don't joke, I guess, but it's, it's been the hardest thing for me to, you know, to quit. You know, I've, you know, I've drank alcohol, of course, I've smoked cigarettes for years. I've, cannabis but i mean nothing has been as hard as to uh to quit uh, to quit sugar um yeah and uh and like i said it's funny that it took it's almost it's almost perfect and poetic that it took our society to go to find and, and to go real cardamore and keto right and, and to, you know for a lot of people to really kind of shine the light on it. and people like you of course have been banging your drum for years and years uh, yeah. and thank you for that but it's funny because we it's almost like the political times. We need both sides of the spectrum to find the middle, right? We need both ends of the craziness to find sanity. And, uh, yeah. I th you know, it's like that helps shine the light on it. So I, do you think that, you know, like the things like the keto and now even the, a bit of a carnivore movement, um, but even like you said, uh, you can still do a low sugar, even a keto vegetarian. It definitely, uh, you know, sure. do you think that's, we're on the right path with that? And you know, I think is, is that, you know, yeah, I, I think the verdict's still out. Um, the, the only thing I can't square 100% with the keto stuff is the endothelioma stuff. Uh, I don't even know if I pronounced that right, but the, okay. that's the one The one thing that, um, you know, I like to use myself as a human guinea pig, and I was vegetarian for years and ate a lot of carbs, and I quit both rice and fruit and all grains. Wow. I mean, I would probably be described as a keto person right now, but, you know, I'm... I'm also very cautious. You know, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't espouse any diet, just whole foods. And yep. I've had people have success uh, on both, but I can tell you a story of when, you know, I was 25 years in, no sugar, no flour, no caffeine. Right. Wow, and caffeine. I had, uh, I quit 
fruit, fruit juice, fructose of all kinds, grains of all kinds. So I love oats and rice, brown rice. I used to eat all that kind of stuff. And I was having this brain fog and I had pimples in my 50s and I had freaking um, my periodontal, my teeth were falling out, uh, my, uh, my hair was falling out. I mean, and that stuff just all stopped, just like that, in, in, in like months. It just all went away when I got off the, and again, I think it's the fructose. I mean, I think that the grains and the ultra processed car, I, I didn't eat any ultra processed carbs, but I did eat grains, oats and rice and other barley, that kind of stuff. And I just uh, have found for my body, it doesn't work that well. I mean, it just hasn't worked that well. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, again, it might be, and I think it's true, and I think I think history is going to tell us this. And I'm probably like I probably have a couple of my coaches quit on me, but <laughs> I think that vegetarian is going to be a, a a a stepping stone to more uh, some animal-based products for some people, you yeah. know. Exactly. And I think that, like you said, too, I mean, first of all, we're very dynamic, you know, we're the most, we're the most adaptive species, we're, you know, we're still here after all these millions yeah. of years. So I think that is pretty, I think, like you said, when the jury comes back, they're going to say that we can pretty much eat everything and then it's going to be, you know, what's optimal and that's going to always be debated, right? Um, yeah. But but like you said, I mean, if you can get, you know, a diet that, you know, checks all the boxes off um, as far as nutritional value, but also doesn't bring any of those toxins that we're worried about as well, right? So that's kind of yeah. my, my, my kind of perspective. Um, but it's funny, you know, one of the things that it, I, I kind of run into at times, you know, with the, the nutritional space or people, you know, um, you know, trying to lose weight is, you know, by going vegetarian or by going plant-based, um, a lot of people don't realize that sometimes that can be synonymous with high carb. Right? right. And all that sure. sugar, you know, unless you're yeah. eating a whole, whole plant food diet, then you're really not right. going to have any refined food. So that you're, you're in good shape there. But if you're eating a lot of, you know, vegan packaged foods or vegetarian, whether it's vegetarian or not, but just packaged foods in general, I think, like you said, over the last 30 years or so, they've been infiltrated those into our diets, you know, and we think those are real food. But um, I think that, you know, I guess what I'm trying to say is that whatever diet people are on, like you said earlier, whole foods is probably the answer at the end of the day. Yeah, I think that the people, this is a real, I don't know if you know the name Gary Fetke. He's a yes. famous, yeah, mm -hmm. he's a famous guy down in Australia, Tasmania. And they tried to take his license away. He was an orthopedic surgeon. He got yes. tired of cutting people's feet off for diabetes. <laughs> and so he talked about this type of diet. And he talks a lot about the fruit. And the, again, when we circle back to my belief in how this, how we got here, it, and, the, and Dr. Lustig talks about the offending molecule being the fructose, right? Yeah. And that, you know, a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, a banana you couldn't even eat because it had so many seeds in it. Yeah. And it was, so it's been hybridized for the fructose for two or 300 years. Apples were those little crab apples. They don't really even taste sweet, but sweet enough for a, some, an animal or us to eat and, and spread the seeds around back in the day, right? And honey, forget about it. How often was somebody going to get any honey? You know? <laughs> and so, but today we have an onslaught of this and, and the hit is not, yes, I think that the carbs and everything raises the, 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 you know, the glucose levels and, and you know, get causes diabetes and da, 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 da. But why people can't quit, and I think also there's actually uh, maladies that exist diagnosed in the, in the, the record books of the, the, you know, the doctors and stuff, uh, fructose malabsorption, fructose intolerance. These things wow. actually exist, right? And there's all kind of protocol on what to eat and everything. And this is like, I don't believe that like if some group of people is sensitive to say lactose or milk or whatever, that other people are supposed to be, you know, those are people are the canaries in the coal mine, right? They're, you can, they're, they're, they're leading the way, right? And so we are ingesting so much fructose and we are manipulating our dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, GABA, oxytocin in such a way that it's so subtle and so nice and so mellow and so elevating in self-esteem that we just don't know it. And the hard part about telling people that fruit, heavy, especially dried fruit and heavy uh, tropical fruits may lead them back to actually process sugar makes people really mad. They're yeah. just like, they can't square it. Years ago, Vecchi talks about this where it used to be the green grocer. Okay. Right. 
and greens are good for you, you know, all kind of good greens, right? But then some marketing scheme got it to the point where it's fruits and vegetables, right? And so it's just kind of, I don't know, I'm, that part, I try and leave alone until people are a little bit more advanced, right? Yeah. I want to get them off the processed food, the, the processed sugar, the processed flour, the carbs, you know, mm -hmm. ultra processed carbs. But I think the stuff you're talking about, bears, uh, is worth talking about because people that are a little bit more advanced and maybe they can't figure out why they, I get a lot of people that can't stay on keto. I know I have a guy who lost a hundred pounds on keto, right? But he could not stay off the sugar. He could not stay off the sugar. He had to stop the fruit. He had to understand why he was drawn to it because of the addictive nature, how, how it made him feel, not what energy he got, not what food product he was ingesting, but how it made him feel, mm -hmm. like smoking a joint or drinking a beer, same thing. And so that's, that's a, real, a real subtle nuance of what we do and a little real subtle nuance of getting well, of changing, right? Yeah. To know that the fructose is gonna be affecting you and it's not just in the process stuff. Yeah, you know, that makes a lot of sense because during my journey, I mean, I started keto around 2016 and I've even before that around 2015, but for, from 2015 to 2016, I would say that whole year I battled trying to get on keto and off again. I do mm. for a month, no sugar, no grains, no fruit, whatever. And after a month, I feel so good. I'd reward myself, Mike. I'd feel amazing. <laughs> I have a beer or whatever. Went back on and then I took me two weeks to get back on. So I did that for a year, killed myself, terrible. Finally, I think I really broke the addiction is I, <clears> I, I tried to do like as long as I could. And I did like 90 days of like 100% compliance. I felt like it was like a boot camp for me. 90 days, no BS, right? And I think that really, really broke it for me. And then at the same time, as I was doing, the longer I was on keto, I found that to the longer I was going to keto and the less plants I was eating, the less just plants in general, the more meat I was eating, the less mm -hmm. of those cravings I was having for sugar. Because yeah. I, essentially, it's probably because I was having real, really no glucose or even fructose at all for that matter. Glucose, of course, a little bit. But I mean, if, you, if you're not having any fructose, right, from the fruit f food you're eating, your body still needs glucose. Your liver can produce some. Yeah. Right. So, you, I mean, and so I wonder if, if the, the natural, maybe I wonder if what I'm trying to say is that I wonder if that's why I naturally kind of gravitated towards carnivore as a way to defend against the sugar addiction. I wonder if that makes sense. Like, well, yeah, no, I, I think that one thing I like about the keto space is that the folks are very democratic and very science based and are wanting to assemble the information of what happened as people pass through this portal, if you will, mm -hmm. they want to know what happened to you. How'd you get here? You know, they want, and they want to take your blood at the events and they want to know what's going on. Whereas in the vegetarian world, um, it, it's more of a kind of like animal <laughs> rights kind of thing. And, yeah, a little more dogmatic. It, yeah, more dogmatic. And, and it's more religious, almost, yeah, more religious based almost. And so I really like that. And, and, and I don't know what the answer is, to be honest with you. I believe the answer is whole foods. But um, I think that there might be a blend of, I actually believe that the body can go back and forth between ketosis and mm -hmm. burning and burning glucose. It sh and I think optimally it should. Yeah. Right. But that's a, I think that's a pretty healthy person who yeah. can, if they just can't get to any of one, they have the other. Mm -hmm. And and I think the range of, you know, they're always, they're always talking about the Inuits, you know, they're always talking about this, yeah. whatever, you know, up here in Canada. Well, yeah, yeah, right. We're talking about like the back and forth. And then there's people only well, grains or whatever, rice mm -hmm. or, 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 and I think that that ability and in, in some of the people that on one group live to be a hundred and another group on the other, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think that we're ultimately adaptable, completely adaptable. And over decades or maybe centuries, uh, groups of people adapt to certain things like the Inuits or maybe whatever you, vegetarian society you can think of. Mm. But I think ideally we probably were made to flip back and forth, you know, yep. and uh, in a very healthy way. So, yeah. and, but I don't think we have the food stuffs around us. And I don't think this one thing that I can't square with folks is that this listening to your own body, 
right? It sounds like trite or sounds like too woo-woo for people. Mm -hmm. And they want a doctor to tell them what to do. They want a, some guy with letters after their name to tell them what to do. That yeah. this is how it's supposed to be done. When in reality, you know, the thing, I, I'm, I don't know, maybe I like being a human guinea pig. <laughs> I, I use my own children in the womb and until they were six years old, I took a risk that said, I don't believe they need flour, sugar, or caffeine to grow naturally, right? And it yeah, worked, that's right? Yeah. Both their brain and their body, it worked. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I was willing to take that risk and people aren't willing to take that risk with their own body. Like if I told a guy, I tell a guy, no steak for a month, or a, <laughs> 60 days, no, if you're vegetarian, no broccoli, no whatever, no, yeah. they say, okay, no problem, and they do it. Tell them no sugar, tell yep. them no bread. Yep. And they freak out like originally, and then they actually can't do it. And they're like, why can't they do it, right? Yeah, right. Then the word addiction comes back around full circle. Exactly, and, and no, no clearer is it to me when I talk about people, than when I talk to people about just keto in general, because the conversation always goes, hey, I get it, Carlo, sugar's bad, sugar's bad, sugar's bad. And then when they say, yeah, you know, there's sugar in fruit, right? <laughs> oh, wait a second, wait a second, that's natural. <laughs> Right. Well, yes, but you know, everything right. is natural. <laughs> everything is natural, right? No, it's, but it's not. Look at look at a navel orange, Carl. I mean, yeah. look at a navel orange. There is no seeds. Well, how does this That's thing true. propagate in nature? <laughs> You're right? right. How do they grow? It's impossible. <laughs> it's impossible, right? And so it it must be engineered, or the the stalk or the tree itself must have been engineered in some, and still is engineered in some way, right? Mm. And these things do not resemble. I mean, how? Uh, 300 years ago, humans resembled humans, right? Yeah, I mean, we're maybe a little bit taller, maybe a little bit different. But, basically but an same. apple, a banana, an orange, uh, none of the fruit that we ate 300 years ago has any semblance of what it used to look like 300 years ago. It, it's, a, it's a process of 300 years of hybridization. Why would, you, why would you hybridize for anything but the sweetness? That's what people wanted. That's mm -hmm. what sold the product. So that's what's in it, you know? So. Yeah. And it's amazing that when, when people, you know, against all odds or, you know, as a rebel, they choose to go against sugar because they, they don't get much support as you know, right? How many yeah. people supported you along the way? You know, yeah, you were that exactly. crazy guy probably that, you know, sure. so, and, and it's amazing that, you know, in these times, like you said, polarity and everything, you really have to be a rebel, go against the grain, go against what most of the Western medicine is telling you yeah. and, and to find these, you know, examples, but it's amazing and, and almost, you know, beautiful in the end that once you do either break an addiction like this or see a life change from, changing your path it makes you now makes me now the advocate makes you now the advocate right you know and bang drum and and um and there are more of us out there there really are we know there's no it's not just me and you out there as you know there's millions, and millions oh yeah of us. yeah no i, I find amazing. that the people who get into these kinds of things are pioneers in something else in their life in their career or the yeah. family or the first person to go to college the, whatever there's something they did something and they were successful in sports or business or whatever they were not afraid to take a risk and think for themselves. Yeah. And, and I love working people like that. And it doesn't yeah. matter. I mean, you don't have to be some highfalutin, whatever. Anybody like they were the first person to graduate high school. I don't care. They were something in there. They were a pioneer. They were willing to get out and take a risk, you know? Um, and those are the kind of people that get well first. The canaries in the coal mine that I call them. You know, they're the yeah. folks that are leading this charge. And they're the folks that are uh, thinking for themselves. Those are the kind of people. And I honest to God, <laughs> I turn away people that I think might, you know, they're like, I'm not going to, I'm not responsible. There's too many people that really want this and I can't be responsible for pulling people up off the couch, man. It's yeah. just too much work. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Now Gary, so good time to talk, uh, Mike, about the, about the book itself. So can you tell us a little bit about it is um, how it was a couple of years ago now? Yeah, or? it's a couple of years old. Now. Okay. It's a, and uh, so what is it, kind of your story? And, and I just tell my story of my, sim similar to my little short version, a little longer, and then some, some tricks and tips to get, um, you know, to get out of it. And, and again, it, if you're afraid of the word addiction, if you, if, you haven't, if you haven't crossed that bridge, we won't get along. If you think that this is like uh, you can take a pill or there's an easy button, there, there isn't. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got to be, like we've talked about, you got to be a little bit of a rebel. 
you've got to kind of um, be willing to think for yourself because you're, you're not going to get, here's the thing that's really interesting, right? You're not going to get any support at home. You're not going to get any support at work. You're not going to get support in your nuclear family or your friends. They're going to support you at the beginning, but then when you start to look different and feel different and act different and eat different, it's not so much that they really want you to do bad things. They want, they don't, they want you to get healthy. But in the old days, if you left the tribe, you could die. And they think in a, in a kind of a primal way that they want to keep you within the tribe. And so they say, put the record books away. It's been 60 days. You've lost 20 pounds. You look great. It's your birthday. You can have cake, right? Yeah. Every single story of someone who had success starts with something like that. They only had one. I'm just going to have one. Which brings me to this topic of abstinence, right? Mm -hmm. People think that this moderation thing is possible, right? They think it's possible to moderate and have a little bit of sugar, right? Mm -hmm. And I know sugar educators that I respect a lot. Um, who still kind of preach this thing, right? And it's just, it, it, for, for one third of the population, it's just not possible. It leads them down the path and it's hard to get back. Yeah, I believe that 100% as well. And, and in fact, you know, me and my close friends and family, oftentimes, you know, I've quite honestly, I've had debates, you know, they say, you know, just, just people of their whole life that have, you know, had this idea that moderation is a key. And, you know, many arguments right. I've had, but first is, what the hell do you mean by moderation? <laughs> what exactly do you mean? Because everybody's definition is different, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and what I, at the same time, would they say that it's moderately okay to do some cocaine every day, a little yeah. bit here and there? I use that so, too. So it, it, it's, so it's so funny to say that. And at the same time, what you said about, you know, people having to, you know, not really having that support. And in fact, almost getting the opposite, getting pushed back when, yeah. when you're just about to really break away from it. That's mm -hmm. when I feel like you get the most pushback. It's like, whoa, you're Carl. the most vulnerable. Yeah, exactly. You're the most vulnerable. That's when they need, you need them the most, right? Yeah. And then like, I, I feel like at my real turning point where I really felt like I was having a little bit of a, a control or a handle on, on the whole sugar and carbs and pasta and everything. It's when people start saying like, just like you said, well, if you lost a bunch of weight, especially being Italian, Mike, oh my God, yeah. you're skinny now, Carl. Yeah, I'm skinny. You, you don't look right. Yeah, you're 200 too pounds, right? Yeah, you're too skinny. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's and, and then I think, like you said about the whole tribe, is that um, you're, you know, that you want people want you to be still part of them. You know, we're all in this tribe together. And mm. also, I think that taps into the their inability to break away from your addiction or their their need yeah. to turn inside and look. Because I I saw that over the years. I mean, I was 300 pounds at 20 years old. You know, so over the years, I've seen so many people lose a ton of weight, gain weight back, back and forth. And then I've seen people lose weight. And then even some people, the odd person will say, oh, I just died and exercise. Well, what the hell are you talking about diet and exercise? <laughs> I did it all right. So all right. after all these years, and I had to finally say, and I had to finally realize that it's, it's, you know, it's done in the kitchen, right? All that work is done in the kitchen. And really, like I said, when you dive down to it, everybody who really gets it with keto mm -hmm. and even the carnivore, but even without carnivore, just keto in general, low carb in general, yeah. Most people get it. They realize that it is a sugar. Um, and the moderation thing, I agree with you. It's like, I think that causes almost more damage than anything saying do it moderately. Cause it's like, it's almost insulting. I'm like, how can I do that? Can you teach me how to do it moderately? Like, I don't know how. Yeah. So uh, I've never seen anybody do it. I, I mean, no. that's, if I thought I could, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to help them. That would be great. Mm -hmm. But it always, and I think the world changes Carl, when we get, um, continuous glucose monitor that you wear on your arm or your stomach Absolutely. Um, and you can read it on your phone so that when you have that donut, the thing goes through the roof or you have even the, the orange that we Wake talked up. about, you know, orange juice and bam, the thing goes flying up and you're like, you're looking at it knowing that your sugar numbers can't, shouldn't be this high. Mm -hmm. And then the world changes. Now you can do it and prick your finger all the time and, and still graph it over the day. But, it, you know, it's kind of a pain. But yeah. when you got that little, and it's not very invasive, really. It's just a little thing you wear on your sh shoulder, your arm, or your belly, or whatever. And you got to get a prescription now in most, most places. But you can, you know, you can get it even on insurance. Just say you're pre-diabetic. Think you're pre-diabetic. They'll give you one. Yeah. And th that changes a lot. That changes people's perception. That kind of biohacking feedback stuff, that's helpful, I think, for the average person. Because they don't really see their innards like they're, this stuff doesn't kill you for 30 or 40 years. It doesn't have a real bad effect, except the weight thing. Yeah. I mean, the weight thing is real. And that's what people usually come for the weight thing. 
Mm -hmm. But then they stay for the no more brain fog, Absolutely. no more lethargy, no more depression. I mean, people get off depression meds. It's amazing. I mean, it's very real. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, I think we're going to see in time is we're already starting to see a lot of doctors out on, you know, social media that they're, they're reversing and treating all sorts of ailments, oh, all yeah. sorts of ailments. Like, it's amazing, you know, and yeah. just by cutting out sugar and they're realizing, or they're having these people with, once you sit down and talk to them for 10, 15, 20 minutes, an hour, and you realize this person has this issue, this person has this issue, and deep down, oh, these guys are all sugar addicts? Hmm. So <laughs> it's like, not to point fingers, but it, all roads lead to Rome. I mean, if all roads lead to sugar eventually, I think no one's going to be really surprised. Um, yeah. You know, and, and the idea too is like, well, how do we do it? How do we get it? You know, how do we, how do we get it done? So the whole continuous glucose monitoring thing, I think that's a great idea. And like anything else, right? Once the pharmaceutical industry can start making money on something else, because they're going to start making, losing money on the, on the diet, you know, the insulin or whatever they're going to stop doing. Because yeah. quite honestly, if you get rid of sugar, you get rid of type two diabetes. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, for the most Bur part. Bird of health. I mean, they've proven yeah. it. They have, they've proven it. They've literally proven it yeah. <laughs> just through diet. Yeah. And uh, it's, I mean, I think Apple and Amazon are both working on a non-invasive glucose monitor like that. Um, no prescription. And when that happens, yeah. people will be able to see it very clearly and they can't right now because it's hidden a little bit. You can't really tell mm -hmm. with the sides. And when we get to be an adult, you're not really getting the buzz anymore. Like you see like when the kids, when the cake comes out at the birthday party, you're actually just fighting off withdrawals. You're just True. coming back to normal. Back to base. Yes. Just absolutely. back to baseline because you don't have time to go through withdrawals. You don't have time to be irritable and lethargy and, and have a headache for two days. You know, you got a meeting, kids, and wife, whatever, husband, you know, you can't, you don't have time. Yeah. And so when, you, and you know how to stop it. And all you gotta do is ingest sugar and it stops, it goes away. And you can just yeah. go right back to your life. Yeah. But you gotta be able to take that break, that six, 10 day break and get yourself out of it and get to the other side. Absolutely. And I think, like I said, that's along with other things, but it's going to be a paradigm shift in the whole fitness industry. I mean, you know, I've, I've dabbled in fitness my whole life. I played college football. Then after that, I was like I said, so there was times where I, I tried to get to be big. <laughs> then once I got to be big, I was yeah. like, you know, how to get rid of that weight. <laughs> but even, you know, I worked in gyms over the years and, you know, the, even the idea of personal trainers is have your meal every couple hours, eat something, have your blood sugar chase. You're basically chasing your blood sugar, right? And now yeah. when you remove blood sugar or remove sugar from your diet, as you see, you're not chasing it. You're stable. You know, one of the, one of the benefits of ketosis is that it's not up and down your insulin's not going on and you know it's you know so sure. there's many many benefits but the other thing too is that um oftentimes i talk to people about keto diet or even now the carnivore diet and people say well i don't have a weight problem and i'm like well it just didn't manifest maybe like maybe for you your disease or your you know unluckiness didn't manifest as weight because other people it's something else you know uh, your arthritis yeah. or your brain fog or like you said so i think more awareness around um it's not just about your belly kind of thing yeah. right it's yeah. about everything else so i think more awareness around that is going to bring people on board and uh yeah oh we have a lot of thin sugar addicts yeah i got an ultra marathoner now she runs uh freaking 100 mile races and she's she can't get you know, she's having a hard time get off the sugar i have an olympic athlete i mean she couldn't get off. i mean she was yeah. The weight was not her issue, believe me. Exactly. She could not put that sugar down. You know? And like you said, that's the other thing is that it's it's remarkable people can still perform at that high level and still yeah. be and still yeah it's amazing i mean i have family and friends that like i said i mean without calling them all out but high performance you know athletes but definitely addicted and they'll tell you as well yeah we're addicted to sugar you know but it's right. funny it's like you know it's uh until it's time time to time to change that and it's like okay shit now we got to get down the business so that, that's the big task so i mean we're going to be wrapping this up pretty soon, but is there any, I mean, definitely I want to send my listeners to check out your book and have a read. Of course, um, is there any couple of things that you think that maybe you can kind of give my listeners a couple maybe tips or takeaways um, as far as maybe, you know, things that we don't really consider um, anything like that. I don't know. Yeah, we were covering it. I mean, it's that thing for yourself kind of thing. And, and it's, you have to ch not necessarily change tribes, but you have to join another one. Like if you were to go to a high status or big say a law firm or a medical practice or i don't know some uh something even as simple as a fraternity or a sorority right when you go and join another group of people that is doing the same things that you want to do um there's an automatic magic to it right mm -hmm. it's a tribe of people uh that are thinking differently and within this advent this day of the internet there are that 
anything you desire. Un I, they always used in college the underwater basket weaving thing. Yeah. If you want to be involved in underwater basket weaving, you can just look it up and there will be people, you know? Mm -hmm. But this thing is one of the founders of the Food Addiction Institute said, this requires an inordinate amount of support. And that's really simply because of all the things you and I have talked about over the hour, which is um, that it's, it's so enculturated, so ingrained, so part of the, uh, the, the culture that people have a hard time being different. Yeah. And, they, and if they're with a group of people who don't feel different to them, they are sugar and flour free or whatever, and they're practicing these things, then it doesn't seem as foreign or strange and you're not as isolated and alone. And that part of it is huge. That awesome. part of it is huge. You know, tricks and tips and hacks and exercises and diets and everybody always wants a recipe book and an instruction manual, right? And there isn't a recipe book and an instruction manual. There's a think for yourself, join another tribe. Yeah. And some people don't want to do that because they feel like they're leaving the other folks, right? Yeah. And that to me is... I'm an introvert at the highest level. You wouldn't know it when I get one-on-one, -on -one, I'm fine. Yeah. But that going to another group or going like for years, the 12 step stuff was good in both alcohol and drugs and food because you found a different tribe, right? You found a different group of people. Forget about what they did or what they preached or the God thing or whatever mm -hmm. the steps were. It was because you were with a different group of people is why it worked. And the people were trying to quit alcohol or quit drugs or what have you. And if you do that either online or in person, you will succeed. I awesome. guarantee it. Awesome. Well, Mike, thank you. Thank you so much for your time, my friend. It was great to meet you. Uh, yeah, folks, check them out. Too. Yes, thank you. Uh, check them out at sugaraddiction.com. And uh, Mike, we'll do a, I want to do a kind of a circle back around in a few months, see how things are going with you, see what's up. Love it, man. I'm Anytime. sure we'll cross paths again in the ancestral world and all of this stuff. Sure. Uh, but uh, thank you again so much, Mike. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks Have for having day. me.